Jesus. Jesus looked at him and said, You are Simon, the son of John. You shall be called Cephas, which means Peter. Please be seated. Let's see how this goes. If you were given some attendance cards this morning as uh, we began our worship service, if you'll pass those to the inside aisles, I have some gentlemen here who will walk up those aisles and take those from you so that we can have a record of your attendance. For those who are visiting with us, we are grateful to have you. We're always grateful to have you. For those who are our regular members here, we're always thankful to have you too. Uh, do me a couple of favors throughout the next couple of weeks. Whenever you think about these things, wash your hands. That's always a benefit for you and for me, uh, and I will try to do that more myself. Uh, also, uh, keep your ears and your eyes open for our members or our friends or our families or our neighbors who might be in need. I may not have uh, any sickness as it goes around, but my neighbor might, and if I could go to the grocery store for them or help them get some medicine that they really need, uh, that would be a shining light for Jesus himself. So let's make sure we are taking care of those who are around us. As I read through the very word of God, I, I look for, and I hope I'm not alone, but I look for people who I can kind of understand their life. Sometimes I have a vaulted opinion of myself and I say, well, I can understand the life of Moses. I, I really can't. I look at men and sometimes I look at men like uh, Jeremiah and I see him where he says, you know what, I'm going to quit this preaching business and I'm going to open up an inn. And sometimes I think, I know what that feels like. I look at men like Andrew who, who bring men to Christ and I think, I, I can get that. I look at David and on some points in his life I cannot understand how he is living and in other points I say, oh yeah, I know exactly how you're living now. But there might be one that you and I both can look at and understand his life probably more than most. He was a fisherman by trade. He was one of those that were the twelve called by Jesus the Christ. He was a disciple. He was an apostle. He was a writer of books in the New Testament. The one called Simon, also known as Peter, you and I can, can relate to him. Here's why. He's the most talked about of those 12 disciples. And if I had an opinion of why, I would say because he made a lot of mistakes. You know what got Peter into the most trouble? It was his mouth. I guess I'm the only one who relates to that, right? Have you guys ever heard of social media? You know what that is? Have you ever heard of, uh, I love to, to say this to my girls, you ever heard of the Instagrams and the Twitters and the uh, Snappy Chats and all those things? Sure. We get on there with our, our mask of invincibility and we write those things. While we may never say those out to people's face, and yet we fall into the same trap that Peter fell into time and time and time again. Our mouth gets us into trouble. Well, as we look at that today, I want you to look at four or five different places and see where his mouth got him into trouble and then really where his mouth was helpful for him. Let's start in Luke, or rather John chapter 13. In John chapter 13, beginning uh, verses 4 through 10 there, you're going to see Jesus and those disciples come into the house. And they're going to sit down and they're going to have a meal. And as they finish that meal, Jesus is going to take off his outer garment. Take off his coat. He's going to lay that to the side. Boy, that feels good taking that coat off. 
And he's going to almost within his waistband tuck a towel around like an apron. And then he's going to take another towel and he's going to go before all 12 of these men and he's going to bend down and he's going to wash their feet and dry it with that towel. He, as the creator of the world, he, the, the Lord, he, the sacrifice, is going to wash the feet of those who are following after him. That should be enough of a lesson for those disciples. But I imagine that while this is going on, there is some murmuring going back and forth to say, what is he doing? Why is he washing our feet? Doesn't he know that there are servants to do that? And he makes it to one by the name of Simon Peter. And Peter, in, in good intentions, and most of the time he has good intentions, but in good intentions he says, you're not going to wash my feet. You know why he says that? When, when Peter looks at who is bent down there to wash his feet, I think Peter sees the Savior of the world. And because he does, he says, that's no place for the Christ. So you're not going to wash my feet. Jesus will reply, if, if I don't wash your feet, then you don't have anything to do with me. Then you're not going to be a part of my church. Then he says, well, if that be the case, then don't just wash my feet. Wash my hands. Wash my head. Wash everything that I have. Do you know how close Peter was from just from what he said to not being a part? Oh, you're not going to wash my feet? Well, then you don't have anything to do with me. Whoa. That went really south really quickly, didn't it? That's not what I meant, Jesus. If that's the case, then wash my hands, wash my head. He said, that's not what this is about. Matter of fact, Jesus goes on to say, it's not about washing the feet, it's not about washing the hands, it's not about washing the head. Well, what it is about is serving each other. As Peter makes mention of those things in John chapter 13, he didn't get that lesson just yet. Look over at Matthew chapter 14. In Matthew chapter 14, the disciples are sent across the Sea of Galilee and Jesus said, I'll catch up with you in a little while. He goes up onto a mountain and he uh, has an opportunity to just relax for a few moments. Be by himself and, and kind of uh, decompress and then, then be ready to go again. These disciples are going across this uh, Sea of Galilee on a boat. Obviously. And the boat that they probably would have used, uh, we found through, through archaeological digs, um, would be somewhere, it would be a, a small fishing boat, probably somewhere around six and a half or seven feet wide and probably 24 feet long. It won't really just be a, a, a large canoe. may have a sail, may not. It's generally propelled by four people with oars. And as these men are rowing across this sea, these fishermen see something that quite frankly scares them to death. They see something out there on the water. You don't see that very much. Especially at night, they must have really, really good eyes. As he gets closer, as they're squinting, and as he gets closer, they see it's a person. And they see that that person is, is walking on the water. Obviously, this is not a person. I have seen people walk into water, but I have never seen anyone walk on water. I've seen children try to walk on water and eventually end up in the bottom of a mud hole, but they never have been successful in walking on top of it. They know, as well as you and I know, that people don't just walk on water. As he gets closer, 
These are his words. Be not afraid. It is I. Did he sound like Jesus? Did that sound like Jesus to you? Perhaps were the words being used there on the boat. Is that, is that Jesus? I don't know. It kind of sounded like him. These disciples, these twelve, as they are going across this sea, as they hear the words of Jesus, as they see him walking on that water, they, they just can't believe it. There's one who says, All right, if it's you, then let me get out of the boat and come see you. And Jesus said, come on. I know what it's like to jump out of a boat into the water to swim. I don't have any idea what it's like to hang my leg over the side of the boat and begin to walk. Sometimes we look at Peter and we say, well, you know, he, he walked for a little while until he saw everything around him being boisterous, then he, then he sank. That's true. But if you look behind him, you'll see 11 more who never got out of the boat. Let me come to you. Let me walk on the water. Oh, easy there, Peter. Did you know, by the way, in the course of human history, there have only been two people to ever walk on the water, and that would be Jesus and Peter? Why didn't he get out of that boat? Why do you think he could just say, well, if you're God, let me get out of the boat? Peter's mouth will get him in trouble. Luke chapter 22. We're inching further and further closer to the sacrifice of the Savior on that cross in Luke chapter 22. And in Luke chapter 22, there's a discussion going on. And Peter says this, I am ready to go to the grave with you. Mm, Peter's mouth. You know what I think? I think in that moment when Peter said, I'm ready to go to prison and to, to death with you, I think he probably was. Or at least he thought he was. He, he thought he was ready to do that. He thought he was ready to take up that mantle and, and follow after Jesus. And Jesus said this. Peter, Satan has a desire to sift you like wheat. And then some of the greatest words ever said to man were said to Peter right here in, in, in Luke chapter 22 where, God, where Jesus Christ says, but I have been praying for you. Now, take that statement just by itself. The one that Jesus said, but I've been praying for you. Can you yet imagine and understand the magnitude of what's being said by the Savior to this man? Not, not only has the church been praying for you, which we know is a, a marvelous thing, and, and we know that, that that proves and yields much fruit, but Jesus, the Son of God, says, I have been petitioning my Father for you. Wow. Maybe he is ready to go to the grave. Oh, if the conversation only stopped right there. Jesus continues and he says, you're going to deny me three times. And then he makes this statement. And when you are converted, strengthen the brethren. You telling me Peter wasn't converted? Are you telling me that Peter what, didn't leave his family for three years and he didn't follow after Jesus? I'm not telling you any of that. 
What I'm telling you is what Jesus said, and Jesus said Peter was not yet converted. Why? Because it's not going to be 12 hours before he denies knowing him three times. But when he is converted, he is moved by the Holy Spirit to write First and Second Peter. If you've never read those books, those are some of the most encouraging books found in the 27. I'm ready to go to the grave. Let me walk on that water. You're not going to wash my feet. Hmm. Peter. Peter, you, you, you could do so much. And yet, your mouth gets in the way. Turn over to Matthew chapter 16. Beginning in verse number 13, they come across into the coast of Caesarea Philippi. And Jesus asks them and says, what are men saying about me in this region? Who are they saying that I am? And, and they answered and said, some say you're Elijah or Jeremiah or one of the other prophets. Jesus is asking what people are, are saying and how they are recognizing him in this particular region. And, and the answer he gets is, you're being recognized as a prophet of God. That's a good thing. And Jesus goes a little further to ask, what are you saying about me that would be different from what men are saying about me? And then he pipes up, Simon Peter. And he said, thou art the Christ. The son of the living God. Amen. Yes, you are. Now, here we go. You are the Christ, the son of the living God. Jesus looks at him and says, Blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for flesh and blood hath not revealed that unto you, but my Father which is in heaven. And I say unto you, Thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. And I will give unto you the keys of the kingdom of God, and whatsoever you shall loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven, and whatsoever thou shalt bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. That goes to about verse number 19. Notice what happens when Peter uses his mouth properly. When he says, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God, Jesus says that will be the basis on which, not just because Peter said it, but that's going to be the basis on which the church is founded. What basis? The basis of Peter? No. The basis that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. That's the cliff face on which the church sits. That's her foundation. If Jesus is not the Christ, not the Son of the living God, then we don't have hope at all. And it is Peter who stands up with those other eleven and says, You're the Christ. You're the Messiah. You're the one we've been looking for for more than 4,000 years. At that point, the Lord gives to him something special. It's found in verse number 19. And he's speaking to the group, but as he's speaking directly, he's speaking directly to Peter. He said, I'm going to give unto you the keys of the kingdom of God. You know what he's going to do with that? He's going to open the door. He and those 11 that are there with him are going to open the doors of the kingdom. They're going to be there when the church will be established. As a matter of fact, Ephesians chapter 3 verses 8 through 11 tells us that, that the, the manifold wisdom of God is going to be seen through that church and it's going to be opened by these gentlemen. He said, I'm going to give you the keys, the kingdom of God. And the things that you will bind will have already been bound in heaven. The things that you will loose from men will have already been loosened uh, in, in heaven. A notation to the fact that when these men speak on that day of Pentecost in Acts chapter 2, that they're going to speak by inspiration. They're not just going to stand up there and say, well, this, this sounds pretty good, let's go with this. Oh no, 
The things they're going to, to teach are what is going to be given to them by God so that God's plan is done. That happens in Matthew chapter 16 because of the mouth of Peter. Thou art the Christ. And since we're thinking about Acts chapter 2, turn over there. This is 50 days after the death of Jesus the Christ. This is after these uh, apostles now have gotten past the fear. As in John chapter 20, you'll see them all kind of huddled in this upper room because the fear is that the Roman government is going to come and get them too. And so they're, they're kind of laying, I hate to say it that way, but they're kind of laying low. And so this is 50 days after all, all those processes have gone. This is, this is after Jesus has been raised from the dead, after he has ascended back to the Father. This is the day of Pentecost. This is the day in which the church doors are open. This is the day in which, according to, uh, once again, Ephesians chapter 3, 8 through 11, this is the day that the angels are looking at and going, Oh, yeah, I see that plan now. That makes a lot of sense. In Acts chapter 2, really beginning in verse number 22 is where, where uh, Peter begins. And we only have his sermon that's uh, spoken on that in Acts chapter 2. I imagine and I, I am pretty uh, assured that uh, the other 11 were preaching too. There are 16 different nations mentioned from verse number 9, 10, and 11 of men and women who were there hearing this. And so he says, You men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man approved of God among you by miracles and wonders and signs which God did by him in the midst of you, as you yourselves know, him being delivered by the determinate counsel and the foreknowledge of God you have taken and by wicked hands have crucified and slain. He is the one whom God hath raised up. Now, for any of you who are as old as I am, you may have had an opportunity while you were growing up in your education to get something known as Cliff's Notes. Do you know what that is? Shake or nod. There you go. If you know what Cliff's Notes are, I'm going to give you the Cliff's Notes of this particular sermon. Are you ready? You killed Christ. Now what are you going to do? Whoa. That's the same sermon in Acts chapter 7 that will get our brother Stephen killed. But here in Acts chapter 2, Paul or Peter stands up with them and said, You've killed Christ. The hope, the Son of God, you've taken him, you've taken him with your wicked hands, you've crucified him and slain him, and God said he's not going to stay dead, he raised him up. Knowing you've done all that now, what are you going to do? How are you going to stand before God now, you men of Israel, with your law and being all holy and standing before the Gentiles and saying, oh, look at us, we're better than you. You kill Christ. As he's speaking those words in verse number 37, a preacher's dream happens. You, you want to know what a preacher's dream is? You get about halfway through your sermon and the, the congregation goes, hey, listen, we need to repent. And you go, well, would you cut this thing short? Let's go. What they say is, what in the world do we need to do? How can we satisfied the justice of God because we killed his son. What are we supposed to do? How am I supposed to stand before God? What a great question. And it is the fact that God uses the mouth of Peter to give them the answer. You know, the mouth that said, don't wash my feet. The, the mouth that said, uh, won't you just let me get out of this boat? The mouth that said, uh, I'm ready to go to prison and to death with you. That same mouth from that same person, you hear these words, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins. 
And you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. It is not long after verse 38 that verse number 41 comes and we find that 3,000 people respond to the invitation that passes through the lips of the Apostle Peter. That's not his invitation. That is the invitation of Christ. And that is the invitation that is still available to man even today. That is the invitation that is open unto us until Jesus would return and this old earth would burn up. And it is the fact that if I'm asking myself, how do I stand justified before God? The simple fact is you need to hear what he has to say. When you hear that, would you believe it with, with everything that you have? Luke, uh, rather, uh, Hebrews chapter 11 and verse number 6. Would you believe that God is faithful to provide for his faithful children rest? And would you believe that God is able to provide for those wicked children? Punishment? If you're willing to believe those things and you understand those things, are you willing to confess that Jesus is the Christ? That same confession that was made in Matthew chapter 16 by Peter. Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. If you're willing to do that, would you be willing to repent of your sin? Turn away from those things that are wicked and begin to follow after God himself and Jesus the Christ. Would you be able to do that? If that's the case, listen one more time to Peter. Repent and be baptized, every one of you. Washing away that sin. Being raised to walk in a newness of life. Romans chapter 6 verses 1 through 4. You can become a child of God even today. And if you find yourself like me sometimes in the same category earlier with Peter's mouth where you'd be okay if you just didn't talk. Why not come back home to God? Our speech ought to be seasoned with salt. It ought to be bringing folks to Jesus the Christ. And sometimes, sometimes it's just not. During those times when he'd look back to that cross, come back home to a God that loves us, to a family that's been praying for us. Let me beg you to do those things right now while we stand and while we sing. I've wandered far away.